Welcome everyone. Uh, we're so glad that you could make it tonight. I know that, you know, in today's world, you could be somewhere else and we really appreciate that you're here and taking time away from your busy schedules and your families. We really want to make this a very productive evening for you, so interactive. Uh, the topic's basically palpitations and the concept is that PVCs and VT are a very common cause of palpitations that are under-recognized even in EPs and we have curative therapy now. Uh, and just a little housekeeping, the bathrooms are right down the hall there. Uh, we have a simulator that I hope you guys get a chance to play with uh, by the end of the evening that actually shows you how we do robotic ablation. Uh, you have some folders on your table that have information about patient stories, uh, testimonials, as well as some contact information for us. So uh, please feel free to ask questions as we, as we go along. So um, the topic is why is PVC and VT relevant to your practice? I like this quote, this, this is sort of how we uh, you know, view ourselves in our relationship with UR referring physicians and with our patients. Heart Rhythm Specialist is the name of our group, we're part of Mission Heritage Medical Group. Uh, I'm very fortunate that I have two amazing partners, uh, Dr. Tiangsen who you met and Dr. Hung. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as interchangeable uh, in dealing with patients, we have very similar practice styles. So this quote is, referring physicians and their patients are the most important visitors in our office. They are not dependent on us, we are dependent on them. They are not an interruption in our work, they are the purpose of it. They are not outsiders in our practice, they are an important part of it. We are not doing them a favor by serving them, they are doing us a favor by giving us an opportunity to do so. The first part that we are going to cover is uh, why are the PVCs and VT, why is this topic relevant to your practice? Uh, we're going to talk very briefly about the types of PVCs and VT. We don't want to make this an overly clinical talk about what we're doing in the lab and ablation mapping and things like that, but we'll talk a little bit about it. How do you treat patients, uh, identifying people who are, are appropriate candidates for a referral to electrophysiology, and when to use medicines, when to consider ablation, that type of thing. So palpitation is one of the most common chief complaint symptoms. Uh, in many cases, PVCs are the cause. PVC is surprisingly, when we were doing some of the research, up to 4% of the general population, which is a huge number. Um, I'm sure I'll have a PVC or two by the end of the talk, and probably some in the audience too. VT for structural heart disease accounts for almost 325,000 deaths per year, and then we deal with idiopathic VT in our, our group as well uh, in healthy hearts, so that's not even including those numbers. Um, so we all know. You know, I, I think our ER colleagues will attest to the fact that palpitation is a very common symptom that people come in with. It results in uh, hospitalizations, it results in a high uh, cost to healthcare, um, and they're challenging to treat. Uh, what is under-recognized is in healthy hearts, you can get a cardiomyopathy from frequent PVCs, and that's something that we've really seen in the literature more so in recent years, and that's why we've gotten so aggressive about treating, that's why we're having this talk tonight is really to try to um, identify patients early on so that they don't come into our office with a low EF and that it's a completely reversible, uh, treatable cause. It's kind of like you think about tachycardia cardiomyopathy with AFib, you can get a PVC cardiomyopathy because the ventricles are out of sync and so you basically get a dyssynchrony that causes the PVCs. The uh, question is how long does it take for the cardiomyopathy to occur? I've seen a, a, a whole range, I've seen people who by the time they come to us, usually they already have the low EF, but there was a gentleman that we did recently who his EF was around 35%, and then we did his ablation, about three months later it came up to 50%. So you can see a fairly rapid reversal. Um, uh, in some cases it can take years. So, but as with tachycardia cardiomyopathy, you can get fairly rapid uh, deterioration of the EF, so it's important to try to be on top of it. The um, medications, so it's not that, you know, this talk isn't about everyone should be ablated. It's about who is, is a good candidate for ablation, what are the technologies available now that we have safe and effective technologies. But it's also about, you know, how do we deal with these patients from the standpoint of triggers that cause their PVCs, whether it's caffeine, whether it's alcohol, uh, emotional stress. Uh, what's the value of magnesium therapy? I think it's a really underutilized, under-recognized uh, etiology of PVCs and not all magnesiums are, are created equal. That's something that I was humbled by and learned about. I used to just dispense magnesium oxide to everyone. It's one of the worst kinds of magnesium you can give someone because it's hardly absorbed by the GI tract. That's why it's such a good laxative. 
um, magnesium taurate, magnesium glycinate, those are the better types of magnesium that are well absorbed. Taurate in particular, um, there's a company, Cardiovascular Research Lab, that makes a really good preparation, 125 milligrams twice a day. It's very effective. I've had people who have like a burden of 20,000 PVCs on their halter drop to 2,000. I had one gentleman like just with magnesium, simple magnesium. Uh, when we do blood tests for magnesium, like in the emergency room or what have you, that's the serum level, right? So we don't have the intracellular measurement of magnesium, and that's what people are deficient in. And apparently, I was reading this uh, the other day, the American diet is actually very low in magnesium for the amount that we need. Um, it's good for brain health, it's good for skeletal muscle recovery. Uh, as far as the meds that we have, you know, the traditional ones that we use are beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, uh, and then antiarrhythmics. As an EP, when we obtain a history of palpitations, not all palpitations are created equal. So we start thinking right away when we hear someone's symptoms, well, what's the mechanism? You know, is this a, a rhythm-based palpitation or is this, you know, are they thyrotoxic or are they anemic or um, something along those lines? And then we think about rhythm, we think about what's the quality? Is it an abrupt onset and offset? I always like to think of a light switch. So we ask the patient, uh, are, your, are your palpitations sudden onset and sudden offset? That makes us think of a reentrant mechanism like SVT, for example. Some of the VTs that occur in structurally normal hearts are catecholamine driven or driven by the uh, autonomic nervous system. So a lot of times you'll see people get symptoms either while exercising, so the right ventricular outflow tract VTs, or in recovery. And when we'll do treadmills on people, we'll often see the PVC show up in recovery. Uh, this one is, is pr pretty helpful for PVCs, the, the flip-flop sensation. I often ask a patient, you know, does it feel like something's turning in your chest or flip-flop sensation? Or do you feel like you're on a roller coaster? Often they will have neck, neck pulsations because of dysynchrony between the uh, atria and ventricles. And then a, a prominent component, as you all know, in, in practice is anxiety. And I think this is a challenge in the ER quite commonly as you have someone that describes a history of a rapid heartbeat. By the time they get to the ER, the symptoms have resolved and the rhythm is normal. And we've seen so many times where people, once they finally have an event recorder or something done, they have PSVT. And by the time they get to the emergency room, the, the, the symptoms are resolved. So anxiety is a big uh, component and, and it feeds on itself. So the uh, increase in adrenaline that you get with the anxiety triggers more PVCs and it becomes a vicious cycle. So an important part of managing these patients is, is really stress management. And I've you know, never thought, and as an electrophysiologist who ablates for a living, that I'd be talking about stress management in the office with patients, but it really does matter. Uh, it makes a big difference. Next slide. So we'll just go through these uh, quickly in terms of mechanism, but um, this talk is really kind of focused on this particular slide, which are um, benign PVCs. So you often hear us uh, discuss right ventricular outflow tract. So this is just beneath the pulmonic valve for whatever reason, and we're still not sure why, it's probably got an embryological basis. There's a predilection to having PVCs from this site. And we're talking about healthy people, any of us. You know, uh, it, it's not well understood why some people get this and, 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 and what the mechanism is, but we do know that it's calcium dependent and that it's autonomically based. And so people will often um, respond to calcium channel blockers, for example, or beta blockers. Um, the other sites can be the left ventricular outflow tract just beneath the aortic valve. Uh, the uh, aortic coronary cusps are sites. Less common locations are the papillary muscle. So these are just sort of random places that you wouldn't think about PVCs coming from. Uh, we actually did a case today of a papillary muscle PVC. This is a 50-year-old guy, totally healthy, Lots of palpitations, did a halter, unifocal PVCs. The 12 at EKG was characteristic in lead V1. We saw a right bundle pattern. So you think about V1 being one of the chest leads that if you have a right bundle pattern, that means that the left ventricle is getting activated first. So it looks like the right bundle is delayed, so to speak. And then in the inferior leads in 2, 3, and AVF, it's what we call superior axis. And so the, um, there were QS waves and so you're thinking about something coming from the bottom pointing superiorly. And so that's a classic pattern for the papillary muscle. And we went in and ablated that and uh, he did very well. Uh, channelopathies was on the previous slide. That's stuff like long QT syndrome, Brugada. Not that common, usually presents with VF or syncope. So not really what we're gonna focus on in this talk.
left ventricular fascicular VT. This is something that you may see in the emergency rooms uh, at times. It's a, it's a very fast VT, typically over 200 beats a minute. Occurs in structurally normal hearts. It involves the, uh, either the left anterior or left posterior fascicle. It's a reentrant arrhythmia. And in the same lines, bundle branch reentry VT, that typically occurs in structurally abnormal hearts. So people with dilated cardiomyopathy, wide QRS complex, what happens is you, you set up a reentrant circle where it can go down one bundle up the other and turn around at the hiss. And so it's a very um, interesting kind of VT. It's very amenable to ablation. That's the papillary muscle VT that I was talking about. Next slide. And then the last is substrate VT. So when you typically hear us talking about VT, we always think about ischemic VT, VT in the setting of a cardiomyopathy. That's what we're talking about here, where you have scar, and then the, the border zone tissue around the scar is what's responsible for the circuit. So when you approach a patient and you're thinking about you know, who would be inappropriate for referral, how do I manage this patient before it, the patient needs to go to an electrophysiologist, the first thing is defining the symptoms, you know, palpitations, of course, fatigue is very common, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, chest pain, those are kind of the characteristic symptoms. So this is one of the few times, as an electrophysiologist, over time, I, I started seeing less and less value of a Holter monitor because, you know, when event recorders came out and, and telemetry monitors came out, you were able to identify symptoms that were relatively infrequent. You put a Holter on someone who doesn't have daily symptoms and you're not going to see much, right? We all order these Holters on people with palpitations and unless they're having symptoms at the time of the Holter, it's not going to be of much value. Well, if you have someone who has PVCs, it has prognostic value. So if you have a burden that's very high and we, we characterize that as over 20 or 30 percent of uh, the beats are PVCs, that puts a patient at higher risk for cardiomyopathy. And so um, that's where the Holter is very valuable in, um, in evaluating PVCs. And then evaluate for structural heart disease. So first thing to do is check an echo, look at the ejection fraction, is there any structural heart disease. The treadmill is very helpful. The treadmill, um, not so much for ischemia, but more for assessing how the autonomic nervous system plays in. So we're all taught that PVCs that go away with exercise are benign and come out in recovery are, are, are typically the benign type. Well, the subset um, called cart, uh, right ventricular outflow tract VT PVCs can actually get induced with exercise. And there's a very typical pattern for those PVCs. You see a very tall R wave in the inferior leads in 2, 3, and AVF. In some cases, um, if there's any abnormality on the echo in the right ventricle, we start thinking about arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, which again is relatively uncommon, but, but uh, increasing in, in recognition. And so in that case, a cardiac MRI is indicated because you get a better view of the right ventricle than you would with an echo. So the question is, what is the, what is the burden of PVCs that, that put the, per, the person at higher risk and over what period of time? On a 24-hour Holter, if you have 20 or 30 percent of the of the beats being premature uh, ventricular contractions. That's really someone that you should think about a referral for more advanced treatment, whether it's antiarrhythmic drugs or whether it's catheter ablation. Because that person, even if they're you know very young, that person is at risk for cardiomyopathy, uh, and it's a completely reversible uh, uh, etiology. Um, I touched about this already, but um, medical management. We talked about the triggers. Uh, stress management is really important. The autonomic nervous system plays a huge role. Uh, a good example of that in the PVC ablation I was doing today, we started out with the patient sedated. He came into the room, he was awake, he was having a ton of PVCs. As soon as the anesthesiologist sedated him, all of them went away and we all took a deep breath and said, okay, now what? So as soon as we woke him up, all the PVCs came out again. And it's just a great example of how much just the level of consciousness and, and emotional stress can, can really play a role in triggering these. Um, magnesium, we talked about magnesium taurate and glycinate in particular. Uh, beta blockers, so I, I've noticed this in my practice that initially I would use metoprolol or atenolol or the ones that we're used to. I found recently with several patients, propranolol made a huge difference when the other beta blockers didn't work and I started looking more at it and it's, it's one of the few that crosses the blood ba brain barrier and it's used for anxiety, right? It's used for stage fright. So it made sense to me that propranol would tackle both aspects of the mechanism, not only the, the ventricular arrhythmia itself, but also the anxiety component that's triggering the PVC. So I found that particular drug to be very helpful.
When we think about calcium channel blockers, verapamil tends to be a little bit more effective than diltiazem because it's got a little potassium channel blockade in it. And then going down to a specialist. So when do you, uh, you consider um, a referral to EP? In EP, as far as antiarrhythmics go, if someone has no structural heart disease, we commonly use flecainide. It, it gets a bad rap from the CAS trial from post-MI patients. But in patients who have no structural heart disease, it's actually a very effective drug for PVCs. And the nice thing is that it's got a relatively low side effect profile. The most common one is headache. Um, in other cases, we may use uh, more potent drugs. Definitely no amiodarone for PVCs if they can be ablated. I mean, we really try to avoid these, these more toxic drugs. So um, this talk is really about how we can partner together with the technology and the experience we have and the patients that you see and how can we help your practice. Next slide. The way that our program works, uh, you know, I, I, I hear a lot from people that someone tries to refer a patient and there's, it, it's difficult to get the person in or there's various challenges in our counter. So I wanted to just show you that we have a very streamlined process. We have a dedicated line, 347-2822. So there's no phone tree. You'll get a live person. Um, and we are always available. Next slide. We're available for uh, same day appointments if you need to get someone in right away. And we strongly believe in follow-up. The patient gets back to you. You're the primary caregiver. And um, uh, making sure we keep you updated with uh, the consult information. So um, this is an example of the technology that we use. So I should, I should, uh, I'm remiss by, by not thanking Stereotaxis, who sponsored our dinner tonight. Uh, Stereotaxis is a company that's been around actually for many years. I think initially started in neurosurgery uh, and has moved in the, in, into cardiology. And um, the idea behind the system is that it uses magnets outside of the patient to manipulate a catheter that's in the patient that has magnets. And we have the um, demo here that you guys can play with um, uh, at the end of the lecture, but it shows you um, these magnetic vectors as we move it with a mouse, we click on a vector, it'll actually take, this is showing the implantation of left ventricular coronary lead, but it's the same idea when you do an ablation is these magnets rotate around the patient. The catheter has three magnets at the tip. And depending on, you can move it in X, Y, Z plane, it'll pull the catheter in different directions. So rather than pushing a catheter, a stiff catheter like we're used to doing, it's a very soft, floppy catheter that's atraumatic. So that's the big thing, the, the message we want to send home today too, is that the technology is safe. It can't perforate the heart. Uh, it's, it's ultra soft and just magnetic fields are what, what move it around. The biggest challenge as an electrophysiologist is this, you know, dealing with these long catheters. It's like, so here's a manual catheter, and you can see, and I'll show you some slides, but it, it's stiff. You know, you can feel it at the tip. And when we're at the patient's bedside down at the groin, we're manipulating this to make this tip move way up here. So I always give patient the analogy, it's like trying to write my name with the eraser of a pencil. Um, with the stereotaxis system, we're actually able to write with the tip because the magnets are located at the tip. So rather than pushing this through, we have um, this ultra floppy catheter that has three dark blue magnets at the tip. And you can see that in the resting state, it's ultra floppy. And then when you apply the magnetic field, it takes you exactly where you want to go. No, so there's no dye with these procedures. Um, you know, the whole electrical system's on the inside of the heart. And so the catheters you'll see have metal electrodes at the tip. So we have a recording system that directly records the electrical impulse and transmits it to a screen. And so that's how we can see exactly where we're going. We also have a three-dimensional mapping system that uses a GPS type technology to, to show the catheter in 3D space that we can manipulate on a computer screen to move it around. It's kind of like when you see the radiologist looking at the 3D CT, same idea. This just shows you an example of the precision that you get with this catheter. So a computer mouse is manipulating these magnetic fields that's causing that. And that's exactly what I did with the procedure today. The location of the circuit being in the papillary muscle is a very hard area to get to. So I literally felt like I was parallel parking. I was pulling back, I was redirecting, I was pulling back, redirecting, and that's what you're able to do with this without worrying about perforation. Uh, the key with a successful lesion when you're dealing with arrhythmias is good catheter contact. And so this catheter, rather than it shows you on this slide, this is the stereotaxis catheter. It's stuck to the wall. That's a manual catheter. You see how it's like 
the tip is really moving. Uh, so there's a big difference in terms of that, that tissue contact, and that's what predicts a good lesion. This shows it the same, this is the stereotaxis catheter. You can see it's sticking to the tissue, and the manual catheter, you can see it's bouncing off the tissue. So literally like every other beat, you're not getting good contact with the tissue. Next, next slide. One of the big advantages of this technology too is the minimal amount of radiation that's needed because we're able to do everything with the three-dimensional mapping system. Big advantage of the physician is not having to stand next to the patient wearing lead, hurting our backs, causing all sorts of issues. Um, this is just some clinical data. Um, it shows that if you do ablations within the first, this is for ischemic VT, if you do ablations within the first uh, period of time after the presentation, that they do much better, they have a much lower recurrence rate, so early intervention is key. Next slide. This is the VANISH study. It basically enrolled patients that had ischemic VT, who had ICDs and VT storms, and found that they compared whether you should give people drugs or do upfront ablation, and they found that ablation was superior in terms of reducing the risk of shocks. So, you know, Mike and Jesus, when you guys see patients coming into the ER with VT storms and getting shot by the defibrillators, those are people that we really should be thinking about ablation for. You know, um, obviously amio and lidocaine, things like that to get them stabilized. But, you know, I have to admit, I've been guilty myself that until I started getting more into VT ablation, I was using these drugs, you know, because that's what we knew. And, and now we know that there's technology out there that's a lot more effective and, and not involving. I think the best thing about this as a physician is that you don't have to worry about perforating the heart. I mean, there's not a lot of things you know, that we have in technology that can do that. Next slide. Um, so just gonna show a couple of cases and then I'll turn it over to Jay. Um, this is a 46 year old woman with a history of recurrent palpitations, totally healthy, really nice lady, mother of two. Um, she has a medical history of hypothyroidism and anxiety. So this is where it gets tough, right? She has a history of anxiety. She's telling me about palpitations. Initially I did a 24 hour Holter, didn't find anything, even did a two week event monitor you know, just like we normally see, no symptoms during that time period. And then of course, as soon as she turns it back in, she starts having a lot of palpitations. So a classic scenario, but we're finally able to catch it that were due to PVCs. Uh, her thyroid, she's used thyroid by the way. She had a normal he echo um, on her Holter. We finally did a, a subsequent Holter and she didn't have a high burden, but she had clusters. So she went a long time with sinus rhythm and then literally from one to 4 p.m. at the park, with her kids, she had ventricular bigeminy. And she was so ridiculously symptomatic with that, that even though it was a low burden, we decided to try to do an ablation. And the reason why I mention it is that it can be a challenge doing a PVC ablation unless you have the PVCs happening during the procedure. That's a big part of it. However, we have technology now called pace mapping, and it's called PASO, where you can actually stimulate different parts of the ventricle, create a 12 lead, of what you're pacing and match that to the PVC. So you only need a couple of PVCs and it's like a matching game. You get like an 80% match, a 90% match. And we actually can see that if you ablate in that area where you get a good match, you actually have a good result. So today's procedure, we actually did a combination of that matching as well as locating the, the PVC with conventional technology. So um, that's why we decided to ablate her is because we tried beta blockers, she had marginal relief, fleck and I'd worked a little bit better, but she actually had a bad headache with it. And she really, I mean, she's young. She really didn't want to take a drug the rest of her life. So we did an ablation. This is her Holter. So it shows, you can't see it from there, but it's only 0.3% PVCs, 458 PVCs in a 24 hour time period. So I have to admit when I was going to the lab, I was telling her in advance, I said, you know, we're not having a lot of PVCs, so we're gonna do our best to try to induce them and map them. But fortunately, we had that technology, that matching software that really allowed me to, even though there weren't a lot of PVCs, actually identify where they were coming from. So this is the classic EKG for someone with what we call right ventricular outflow tract PVCs. So when you deal with healthy people that have PVCs, a lot of the times this is what it is. So whenever you're doing an EKG in the office, kind of think about this pattern that you have in V1 and V2, a left bundle pattern. That means that the right ventricle is getting activated first. And so the, uh, the left ventricle, because it's delayed, it looks like it's relatively, the left bundle is blocked, so to speak. And then in leads 2, 3, and AVF, um, 2, 3, and AVF, you see a nice tall R wave. That's the hallmark 
of an outflow tract PVC because the outflow tracts are really high up in the heart. So they're gonna point down to the inferior leads. You're gonna get a nice tall R wave. So one of the um, big uh, breakthroughs in mapping technology is PVCs, it's kind of like whack-a-mole, you know, that game where you like, it shows up one place and you go find it and then it's, it's showing up another place. You're chasing it around. So we, technology got developed where you can have multiple electrodes on catheters and you can do a very quick map. So it's almost like getting an, an overview of exactly where the problem areas are rather than moving a tiny little catheter around all over the heart. And so this is a pentaray catheter and it has multiple electrodes on it. It's like a paintbrush. So when you see us, if you ever see the color maps that we create with EP, it's from this catheter. And it'll essentially gather hundreds of points just as I move it around the heart so I can identify exactly where impulses are coming and where, where they're going. So I'll pass that around. This is her uh, three-dimensional map. So the colors represent where, it's kind of like a runner in a racetrack, where the runner starts, where the runner finishes. And so the red is what we like to see. Red means where the arrhythmia is coming from. It's the earliest, and it doesn't project that well here, but the, the red is up here. There's two blue dots, that's where we ablated, but there's a small red area here. And then it's like a pebble in the pond. The, the red is where the pebble starts, and then it radiates outward. So these other colors that we see as they change, it tells you where is the heartbeat relative to that origin. This is what activation mapping is. The other technique that we use, this is what I was talking about, the, the matching game, the 12 lead match. It's called pace mapping. And so you can't see it that well. It's in the slides in your handout, but there's a red and uh, there's a yellow and there's a green line overlay, overlying each other. And basically the software takes the paste beat, compares it to the PVC beat and gives you a match. And if you have over a 90% match, that's a good place to ablate. Next slide. So this is what EBC, uh, EPs uh, like salivate over when, when, we, uh, when, we, when we see this kind of thing. Um, so here's uh, sinus rhythm. Then she starts having, uh, then I start ablating right here, and then we have a whole series of PVCs. So clearly I'm tickling the tissue that, where it's coming from. That's what we like to see as a run. And then within seconds, you see the run, bang, stops. And that's, that's really what you like to see. And today's case was the same, same kind of thing. So um, the uh, outflow track PVCs, we kind of talked about it already. Um, one of the interesting things about the outflow tracks is that they're sort of overlapping each other, the right and left ventricular outflow tracks. So a lot of times you can have PVCs that originate somewhere in the middle between the two, and it's hard to tell which side they're coming on, so we have to use the 3D mapping to isolate that. But you basically can have, this is a, a kind of a superior view. You have the mitral valve, tricuspid valve, the atrial appendage, the aortic cusps. We can basically have, you can have PVCs originate from really anywhere. There are certain common sites but that's the challenge with EP, is that as opposed to SVT, where it comes from discrete locations, PVCs can originate from any kind of myocardial tissue. And this just shows you again, this is the right ventricular outflow tract, the left ventricular outflow tract. You can have PVCs originate from a variety of locations. And what this slide is meant to show is what does a QRS complex look like relative to the location that it is. And so we actually, before going in, have a little bit of a game plan that if we see that this is representing lead one, a uh, V1, okay, is what you're looking at. All of these are lead V1. So at position one is in the right ventricular outflow tract, you have a left bundle pattern in V1, which means that it's originating from the right ventricle. Position five, it's originating from the left ventricle, so you have a right bundle pattern because the left ventricle is getting activated first. Case two is a 68-year-old male with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and PVC. So this is a great example of how that high burden can cause a cardiomyopathy. It's always chicken or egg. You know, the person shows up with an EF of 30%, they're having all these PVCs, let's put in a defibrillator. I mean, that used to be the way we used to think, and now we're seeing that it's not necessary that the cardiomyopathy is the primary problem. It can be the PVCs that are inducing the cardiomyopathy. So in his case, um, we, uh, 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 he had the full workup for cardiomyopathy. His coronaries were clean. He had symptoms of dyspnea on exertion and fatigue. Um, his uh, Holter showed unifocal PVCs. He had over a 30% burden. It was about 35,000 PVCs. And the PVCs had a right bundle inferior axis pattern. So it was coming up somewhere in the left ventricle, somewhere high up in the outflow tract. We tried Carvedilol. We were limited by, um, by the uh, blood pressure. And there's really not a lot of other 
uh, non-antiarrhythmic drugs that you can use for this population of patients. So we did an ablation of PVCs at a rich, it was kind of an interesting location. It was basically uh, originating from the distal part of the coronary sinus vein and the left ventricular outflow tract. You'll see on this slide, next slide, next slide, that's the halter. So I know this doesn't project well, but this is basically the coronary sinus. So your right atrium would be here, your right ventricle would be here. The coronary sinus wraps around to the left ventricle. So one of the uh, points of the PVC was originating way out here. And then the um, uh, left ventricle is here. And then this is the aorta. So the outflow track would be right here with, uh, just beneath the aortic valve. So the PVC was originating right between these two structures. So what's amazing in EP technology now is that we can get to any of these places, you know, basically through ephemeral puncture. And we can't get to it easily with a manual catheter, but the, the robotic catheter, we can get to it safely. I wouldn't even think about using manual catheters in some of these cases where they're originating so close to critical structures, but with this catheter, you can see it's, it's sticking to the tissue, so you're not worried about if you're ablating near a critical structure, is it gonna slip? You know, is it gonna go somewhere? In this particular case, you could see this is this coronary angiogram, which we have to do when we're in this location to make sure we're not near a coronary. It's, it's like a millimeter away from the coronary, but you start off at low power and you watch it carefully. It's, you know, it's, you're, you're kind of holding your breath, but this is an extreme case. Uh, but it, I, I show it to show you that even in high risk locations, you can do this procedure safely. I mean, it's a risk. Uh, the question is about um, uh, causing AV block. I think, Jay, you had a case recently, right, where it was around the His bundle? Yeah, you, he has, a, he has a, a, a case to show on that, so. Um, this is just a paper. There's lots of papers now that are published on this about the PVC cardiomyopathy, showing the relationship between the amount of PVCs and the drop in the ejection fraction over time. Next slide. Uh, this last case, before I turn it over to Jay, uh, is a case about VT. This is a 70-year-old male. He has a history of ischemic heart disease. Uh, his EF is like in the 45 to 50% range, but he had an out-of-hospital arrest. And so he got a defibrillator, uh, and he was doing great. I mean, he's playing tennis, feeling fine. And we have him on the home monitoring, you know, with the defibrillator. So we were able to pull up transmissions in the office. And we started seeing all this non-sustained VT out of nowhere. I mean, he was feeling fine. There was nothing, didn't appear like ischemia was triggering it. And the question was asked earlier, I think, Mike, you asked it, um, how long does it take to develop a cardiomyopathy? So like in January, he had an EF of 45% after all this non-sustained VT. In February, he had an EF of 30%. It dropped that fast because of all the non-sustained VT that he was having. Um, and so uh, he basically ended up coming in through the emergency room finally with VT storm. So he was having just runs and runs of VT. We gave him amia, we gave him lidocaine, couldn't quiet it down, so we took him to the lab for ablation. This shows you his VT. This, uh, this is in your handout, so you can look at it later, but this is kind of the way that we think about when we're looking at a 12 lead EKG of where, where is VT coming from. We look at the pattern in lead V1, what the bundle branch pattern is, the axis, the transition across the picordial leads, so I won't go into detail there. This is where imaging can be very helpful. So for this patient, whenever you have ischemic VT, you start thinking about where is the scar? Where, is the, where did the person have an MI? Because that's usually where it's coming from. So in his case, it was coming from the inferior wall, infraposterior wall, and that's where on the echo, he had hypokinesis and akinesis. So this is um, a fluoro image. You can see his defibrillator. There's a lot of hardware in there. There's sternotomy wires. But this is, the, this is the slide that EPs salivate over again, okay? So he was in VT. We, we ablated within uh, a few seconds, he converted to sinus rhythm. And then you can play that video. This is a shot of his left ventricle and it's an animation map created with our 3D software. So you're literally seeing a VT beat slowed way down. So this is going at like 200 beats a minute, but we're just seeing one VT beat and how it travels around the ventricle. It's kind of like a runner in a racetrack. So we're trying to identify where that runner stops and where that runner uh, starts and where that runner finishes. This area here you see here is the area of his scar. So it took up such a big portion of his ventricle and the way VT works is it's not just the entire scar that it goes around. There's little islands of healthy tissue. And so you literally can have circuits originate from any of these spots. This is what's called a voltage map. So 
Purple means healthy tissue, and all the other stuff in, in there means scar or diseased tissue. So you could see such a huge, this is just his left ventricle. So that would be his mitral valve, and his atrium would be up here. So just his left ventricle. See a huge area. It looks like a, a geographical map, right? I mean, you see areas of healthy tissue in between areas of scar. So the strategy in these patients is we'll identify some of the critical circuits, but sometimes we'll do what's called substrate ablation, where we identify the islands of diseased tissue among scar and healthy tissue and we target those and it's an empiric approach to dealing with VT because again it's like that whack-a-mole analogy you get rid of one VT another one will pop up and so this is a, a, a different technique that we use so that's it for my presentation I'll turn it over to Jay but again we uh, you know one of the big messages we wanted to send home tonight was just increasing awareness of PVCs that the deleterious effect it can have even in healthy patients uh, regarding cardiomyopathy, that we have technologies that are very safe and effective, uh, that times to consider a referral is if people are obviously having very symptomatic palpitations. It doesn't have to be a high burden like I showed in that one lady. Or even in asymptomatic people who have a high burden, something to consider uh, EP referral for. And I'll turn it over to Jay.